the regular broadcast of the Minneapolis, Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission for March 1st, 2022 will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to this live broadcast of a virtual meeting of the March 1st, 2022 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. This meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. For the record, my name is Madeline Sundberg and I serve as chair of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so we may verify the presence of a quorum. Commissioner Bjornberg. Present. Commissioner Booty. Present. Commissioner Howard. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Nystrom. Present. Commissioner Sandbolt. Present. Commissioner Struthers. Commissioner Sundberg. Present. Commissioner Vanderyk. Here. That's eight members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we do have quorum. With that, we will proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at lims.minneapolismn.gov. Our first order of business is to adopt the agenda for this meeting. We'll work from the agendas that are available online. I'll go through the agenda and sort out what items will be continued to a future meeting, what items will be discussed, what items will be put on the consent agenda to be approved as recommended by staff without further discussion. Item number four is 2424 West Lake of the Isles Parkway, Ward 7. This is a demolition of a historic resource. This item will be discussed. Um, that is our only item for tonight. So again, the proposed agenda is item 4, 2424 West Lake of the Isles Parkway. We'll have a staff presentation, public comment, commission discussion, and action. Commissioner, may I have a motion to approve the proposed agenda? Bjornberg, so moves. Thank you, Commissioner Bjornberg. Is there a second? Johnson, second. Nice. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Commissioner Vanderike. Aye. Chair Sundberg. Aye. That's eight yeas and zero nays. Thank you. The agenda is approved. Our next order of business will be to approve the minutes from our February 15th meeting. Um, may I have a motion to approve those me meeting minutes? Booty, so moves. Thank you, Commissioner Booty. Is there a second? Johnson seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Abstain. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Abstain. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Commissioner Vanderike. Aye. Sunberg. Aye. That's six yeas and two abstentions. Thank you. The minutes are approved. Before I open the hearing to public comments, let me summarize the process for conducting the hearing in this virtual format. 
The process for the public hearing is as follows. We will take each agenda item in order. First, planning staff will present its report and commissioners may ask questions of staff. Then we will hear from the applicant and commissioners may ask questions of the applicant. After that, I'll open the public hearing and invite public comment. We will take speakers in the order they pre-registered. Speakers will be limited to two minutes. Um, when your name is called, if you please state your name and address for the record and then proceed to your comments. After you've completed a list of pre-registered speakers, I will see if there are any other speakers who may have called in. In order to activate your microphone, you'll need to press star six on your phone and wait to hear the pre-recorded message before we can hear you. So again, I'll take the pre-registered speakers in order and then open the floor to any other speakers in the queue. Um, please keep your comments to the specific application that is before us today. After the public comments are complete, I will close the hearing. Commissioners will deliberate and act on the application before us. So with that, our first item is item number 42424 24, West Lake of the Isles Parkway, Ward 7, Demolition of Historic Resource. The staff report will be presented by John Smalley. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is John Smoley and I'm pleased to be before you this evening to discuss the proposed demolition of a historic resource application to demolish more than 60% of the residents at 2424 West Lake of the Isles Parkway in the Kenwood neighborhood. Next slide, please. The subject property was designed by master architect Carl Gage and constructed by Eugene Kaiser in 1929 and 1930 for grain trader James R. Stewart and his wife Isla. The Stewarts chose a prominent piece of undeveloped land on a point along the western shore of Lake of the Isles to build their home. Next slide, please. The subject property is a two and a half story Tudor Revival style single family residence. The stucco clad dwelling is laid out in an irregular plan with a slate clad cross gable roof bearing two brick chimneys and a brick elevator overrun. A hip roofed wing extends northward from the center of the residence on the rear where a non-historic garage constructed in 1984 connects perpendicular to the end of the residence. Next slide, please. The applicant proposes to remodel the existing single family residence for use as a more accessible single family residence with a more open floor plan, newer garage, and wider driveway. Specifically, the owner intends to demolish the original one stall garage and the non-historic 1984 four-car garage addition with a laundry room and a new elevator in place of an original elevator. Raise the house in the north, or sorry, raise the grade in the northwest area of the lot to construct a new garage at the same level as the main floor of the house. Relocate the driveway to enter the lot from the southwest corner instead of the eastern side through the historic port cochet with arched opening. Replace the historic port cochet's arched opening with a large arched window in matching proportions at a similar location. Demolish the northern wing and rear half of the home, replacing it with new building segments with larger footprints, open floor plans, accessible floors, and a more modern kitchen. Add a new add new integrated ornamental metal window boxes at both the existing house and at new punched openings on the second floor to match the original design. Replace all existing windows, most of which are historic true divided light windows with energy efficient insulated windows with a simulated division of lights and replace doors with new doors bearing insulated glass with a simulated division of lights. The extent of this work is so great that it meets the city's definition of demolition defined by the heritage preservation regulations as the act of moving or raising a building, including the removal or enclosure of 60% or more of the structure. So again, that's the act of moving or raising a building, including the removal or, or enclosure of 60% or more of the structure. This is a linear measurement of exterior changes, not interior changes. Window and door replacements and existing rough openings do not count toward the demolition. Replacement of roofing material does not count toward the demolition. Even new wall cladding does not count toward the uh, demolition. Alterations meet the definition of demolition when they change the size of existing wall openings, create new wall openings, or change the design of the roof structure. Even without taking into account the applicant's replacement of all windows on the subject property, the proposal demolishes nearly 70% of the exterior of the residence. The slide you're seeing shows areas proposed for demolition, which are shaded. 
Although some of the front of the residence will remain, though with replacement windows, little will remain of the building beyond the facade. In terms of public comment, staff has received six letters in support of this project. One from the Kenwood Neighborhood Organization and five from neighbors of the subject property, as you've seen in your staff report packet and as you have received this afternoon. One additional letter with comments is also before you today. Your review this evening is not the first eligibility review of the subject property. This home lies within the potential Lake of the Isles Historic District. The eligibility of this potential historic district for local designation has been affirmed by every major study of the area conducted over the past four decades. Those studies are a 1984 City of Minneapolis designation study and National Register nomination, a 1999 Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board commissioned National Register eligibility study, a 2006 City of Minneapolis Reconnaissance Survey funded by the National Park Service and approved by the State Historic Preservation Office, and a 2014 Metropolitan Council in Hennepin County Southwest Light Rail Transitway Section 106 review overseen by MnDOT. All of those studies conducted by all of those agencies came to the same basic conclusion. The potential Lake of the Isles Historic District was eligible either for a local designation, national register listing, or at the very least, intensive level survey. In the past, you've reviewed other proposed demolitions in this historic district and have at times authorized their approval for a variety of reasons specific to the findings for the particular properties in question. In those instances, the properties were typically deemed contributing resources to this potential historic district, like the subject property. Unlike those properties, this residence has been determined significant not just as part of the potential historic district, but as a landmark on its own. The most recent evaluation of the subject property was commissioned by the applicant and conducted by a historical consultant, Landscape Research. That is attachment two in your staff report packet. In this report, Amy Lucas evaluated the subject property's eligibility for designation as a landmark, not as part of the potential Lake of the Isles Historic District. She deemed the property eligible for designation as an individual landmark. She rated the property's integrity very high, determining that it retained all seven aspects of integrity. Staff agrees with their assessment. This is a very important point. This property is unlike other Lake of the Isles demolitions that you've reviewed. It is eligible for designation as a landmark, not just as part of the potential historic district, and neither staff nor the applicant disputes its significance and high degree of integrity. But significance and integrity are not the only factors considered in demolition of historic resource applications. So let's take a look at the demolition of historic resource findings. Next slide, please. Per the city's heritage preservation regulations, the Heritage Preservation shall, Commission shall approve the demolition of a historic resource if the destruction is necessary to correct an unsafe or dangerous condition on the property, or there are no reasonable alternatives to the destruction. In determining whether reasonable alternatives exist, the Commission shall consider, but not be limited to, the significance of the property, the integrity of the property, and the economic value or usefulness of the existing structure, including its current use, costs of renovation, and feasible alternative uses. Staff and the applicant are in agreement on all findings, but the very last one. Staff and the applicant agree that no unsafe or dangerous conditions necessitate the destruction. Staff and the applicant agree that the property is very significant, and staff and the applicant agree that the property retains all seven aspects of integrity. But while staff believes the property retains tremendous economic value and usefulness, the applicant does not. So let's go through each of these findings. First of all, in terms of the first finding, again, neither the applicant nor CPED finds the demolition is necessary to correct an unsafe or dangerous condition. In terms of finding 2A, significance, both staff and the applicant's historical consultant recommend the property as eligible for local designation under criteria 2, 4, and 6. City staff also finds the property eligible for designation under criteria 3. Next slide, please. The house at 2424 West Lake of the Isles Parkway is significant under Criterion 2 for its association with prominent grain trader James R. Stewart, who had the residence built in 1929 and 1930, and who lived in the house with his wife Isla for the remainder of their lives. Stewart was born in 1874 in Ottawa, Canada, the son of Scottish immigrants. 
One of nine children, he moved to Grand Forks, North Dakota in 1879. Stewart entered the workforce in 1891, beginning work with the Western Grain Company. He was successful enough to amass the capital necessary to open his own grain business at an early age in 1894 and to become a lifelong philanthropist for local causes. He credits his philanthropy directed toward less fortunate youth to his challenging upbringing in his early years. Despite this, he proved highly adept at financing, constructing, and utilizing grain elevators and shipment terminals at a very young age. He moved to Minneapolis in 1901 and established the Banner Grain Company, serving as its president. He was successful enough to purchase a 340-acre farm in Savage in 1920. His estate was valued at an estimated $1.7 million at his death in 1958, even after purchasing a 680-acre farm with his son-in-law with his son-in-law and donating it, donating it to the Volunteers of America, to which he was a lifelong contributor for use as a ranch for underprivileged children. Next slide, please. The residence is significant under Criterion 4 for representing the distinctive characteristics of the Tudor Revival style of architecture. As you can see from these photos of the front and rear of the home, this cross-gabled house possesses a high-pitched, prominent front-facing gable, stucco cladding, massive chimneys, tall and narrow windows in multiple groups with multi-pane glazing, and a front entrance with a masonry surround, all characteristic traits of Tudor Revival residences. Next slide, please. The subject property is also significant under Criterion 6 for exemplifying the works of master architect Carl A. Gage. Carl Alexander Gage began his career as a designer in Minneapolis's Flower City Ornamental Iron Company, whose wrought and cast iron decorate such buildings as the Palmer House Hotel in Chicago and the John Adams Building in Washington, D.C. After several years there, Gage became an architect, working in the firms of Thomas Holyoke, Ernest Kennedy, Edwin Hewitt, Bertrand D. Chamberlain, and finally Tyree and Chapman, before establishing his own practice. Gage is best known for designing upscale houses in Minneapolis, especially in the Tudor Revival style of architecture such as the Goodfellow Residence, now the Bakken Museum, 5013 and 5017 Belmont Avenue South in Minneapolis, and 3430 and 3520 West Bidea Macosca Boulevard. One of Gage's commissions, the Sigma Kappa Sorority House at 521 12th Avenue Southeast, has been designated as a contributing resource in the city of Minneapolis's University of Minnesota Greek Letter Chapter House Historic District as well. Again, both staff and the applicant are in agreement on this significance. Next slide, please. Staff also identifies the property as being significant under Criterion 3. Criterion 3 states the property contains or is associated with distinctive elements of city, of city or neighborhood identity. And staff would state that being a single family residence on the shores of the Lake of the Isles, arguably the city's most prestigious lake, fronting on Lake of the Isles Parkway, arguably the city's most prestigious drive, this property does merit consideration under Criterion 3 or is, is eligible under Criterion 3. The Kenwood neighborhood is known for its historic single-family homes on the chain of lakes, the source of the City of Lakes nickname, created after the rise and fall of the Mill City's preeminence in lumber and flour milling at the Falls of St. Anthony. Of all Minneapolis neighborhoods, Kenwood is arguably the most defined by lakes, bordered on two sides by lakes, Cedar to the west and Lake of the Isles to the east, with a lake channel, the Kenilworth Lagoon, on its southern border. While the neighborhood is replete with single-family residences, this residence was designed by a master architect for a significant Minneapolitan and embodies the distinctive characteristics of an architectural style. This significance was recognized in the 1984 City of Minneapolis designation study of Lake of the Isles Potential Historic District, which named the Stewart residence one of the 16 most pivotal properties in the district. Next slide, please. In terms of integrity, staff agrees with the applicant's analysis that the residence in question retains all seven aspects of integrity. The Tudor Revival design of Carl A. Gage maintains its proportion and ornamentation. Alterations occurred at the rear of the residence where they are least visible from the public right of way, helping to ensure the property retains integrity of design. Original stucco, slate, brick, and stone materials remain intact in the vast majority of the home, despite the loss of some materials to rear additions. And the early 20th century workmanship used to produce and assemble these materials remains quite evident, ensuring the property retains integrity of materials and workmanship. The home has never been moved, ensuring it retains integrity of location. 
and the neighborhood remains mostly single family residences set around one of Minneapolis's premier lakes, ensuring the residence's integrity of setting remains intact. The property's original use as a single family residence remain, remains unchanged, and it continues to evoke the feeling of an early 20th century residence. Next slide, please. In terms of the economic value or usefulness of the structure, the application states that the economic value and usefulness of the existing structure is significantly impaired by lack of an at grade entrance to the house, lack of a stairway separating the second floor's bedrooms in the main home from the recreation slash bonus room area above the garage ring, uh, wing, and the size and layout of rooms and circulation paths on both floors not being consistent with universal design principles and not meeting the needs of most contemporary urban homeowners, particularly by not being entirely accessible to persons of all abilities. Staff disagrees with this assessment. The home retains considerable value, having been purchased as is for $3.65 million in May of 2021. Furthermore, the vast majority of existing low density residences have some steps and extremely few have an elevator to improve accessibility, while this home historically had, which this home historically had and currently possesses. While the remodel will ostensibly do much to make the home accessible, plans indicate exterior stairways will remain on all four sides of the building. The application also states that the house has experienced six changes in ownership since it was sold by the Stewart heirs in 1991 and has not gained value through the sales and renovations. Staff would point out that although the applicant's report does not identify the home sale, home's sale price during a nationwide recession in 1991, its most recent sale price is more than twice its 1998 sale price. The applicant also cites vehicular circulation problems, noting that the existing driveway opens from West Lake of the Isles Parkway at the northeast corner of the lot and runs past a projecting bay window and through a port crochet too small to allow for the safe passage of vehicles. The port crochet measures eight feet, 11 inches wide and between seven feet, two and a half inches to seven feet, eight and a half inches high. Staff would point out that the applicant has received approval from the Minneapolis Park Board to relocate the curb cut to the south side of the lot, eliminating the need to drive through the port crochet which actually provides more room for vehicles than the drive aisle of a standard two car garage door. Typically seven feet in height and 16 feet in width, standard two car garage doors provide eight feet of width per vehicle and seven feet of vertical clearance, which is also the common clearance provided in parking garages. In terms of the property's current use, the existing and proposed uses of the subject property are the same. The applicant is currently using the building as a single family residence and intends to do so after the proposed 60% demolition and remodel. In terms of cost of renovation, the applicant has not provided estimated cost of renovation, but plans indicate that nearly 70% of the existing $3.65 million home would be demolished and rebuilt even bigger than it currently is. In terms of feasible alternative uses, the subject property is zoned for a variety of low density residential uses, but the applicant seeks no change of use. The applicant is currently using the subject property as a single family residence and has confirmed their intent to do so in the future. Staff finds the subject property is eligible for designation as a landmark under criteria two, three, four, and six under Code of Ordinances Chapter 599.210. Staff finds the subject property retains all seven aspects of integrity and no unsafe or dangerous conditions exist on the property. Lastly, staff finds that there are reasonable alternatives to the demolition considering the significance, integrity, and e economic value or usefulness of the existing structure. For these reasons, CPED recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings for the application by HGA for the property located at 2424 West Lake of the Isles Parkway and denies the demolition of the historic resource application, establishes interim protection, and directs the planning director to prepare or cause to be prepared a designation study. I am available for any questions that you may have. I know the applicant has several representatives here as well. And I'm very pleased to say we'll have a cameo appearance from one of our former Heritage Preservation Commissioners as well, Linda Mack. Thank you, John. Are there any questions for staff? I don't see any questions at this time. Thanks, John. Um, I will now open the public hearing for this item. Um, as I understand it, the applicant is here to speak. 
I'm not sure which order you would like to go in. I have uh, Joan Serrano as the first and then Carol Ansing as the second, but if you'd like to switch that order, that's fine. If you could just press star six on your phone, wait to hear the pre-recorded message to activate your microphone and then state your name and address for the record. Good evening, commissioners. This is Carol Lansing. I will go first. Um, I'm an attorney at Fagri Drinker, 90 South 7th Street, Minneapolis and I'm assisting Joan and HGA with the city and park board processes for review of the proposed uh, remodeling of, of 2424 West Lake of the Isles. <clears throat> I'd like to say a few words about the choice we would like you to make in your decision tonight, and then Joan um, will explain the proposed work and the reasons for it. As, as John correctly noted, we are not asking you to conclude that the house is not a historic resource or that it is in an unsafe or dangerous commission condition. However, we don't agree with a conclusion that it is very significant. And um, Amy Lucas did not engage in a comparative analysis of other Tudor homes, other works by Gage, or of students' relative, Stuart's relative importance um, in the history of, of Minneapolis. So while it uh, appears eligible uh, under those criteria, I don't think we can say we agree that's very significant. Um, but what we are asking is that you conclude that there are no reasonable alternatives for long-term preservation of the house other than an extensive remodeling that ex exceeds the 60% threshold for how the city defines demolition. There have been six changes in ownership since 1991, and three of those occurred within the last 10 years. The sales price of the property was $3.3 million in 2002, and increased to only 3.65 million by 2021. That's still obviously a high value property, but the stagnation of its value and the turnover in ownership reflects the fact that no one who can afford to live on this property wants to live in the house as it's configured. Joan has met with many neighbors and the Kenwood Neighborhood Organization to discuss the problems with the house and show them the plans for partial demolition and new additions. Everyone she met with is supportive of the design and agrees that the proposed plans are the best chance for preserving the historic and architectural character of this house for decades to come. Commissioners, the Historic Resources Ordinance gives you the latitude to apply both practical and policy considerations to your decision tonight. When you consider the economic value and usefulness of the existing house, you can factor in the reasonable expectations of owners and residents of a house like this for accessibility, convenience, and functionality. So again, we are asking that you find that there are no reasonable alternatives to the proposed partial demolition. And now, um, unless there's questions for me, Joan Serrano would like to speak to you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I think if we could go straight to Joan and then see if there are any questions for the applicant team. Joan, I'm wondering if you're able to unmute yourself. Can we tell if Joan successfully called into the meeting? Chair Sundberg, it does appear that um, Joan has uh, called into the meeting. It may be prudent to uh, remind them that they would need to press star six and wait for the message. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Mr. 
Madam Chair, this is Ken from the clerk's office as well. I, I would also suggest that if, if she can hear this, that she may want to check if her own device is muted. Um, that that could potentially be the issue. Thank you for the technical support. Chair Sundberg, I did just let in another caller um, to the queue, but um, for protocol, we did mute automatically. But if that if that is the caller, they may want to press their six to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. You hear yes, I heard you. Okay, sorry about that. I was on using my my iPhone and pressing star six, and nothing happened. So um, sorry about that. I am now using my husband's phone. So happy to be here. Everyone can hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I, before I uh, can, I've got a presentation. If you can pull up slide one, please. And I can't see the screen, so I'm assuming that will be pulled up. Um, before we talk about the design of uh, 24, 24 West Lake of the Isles Parkway, I'd like to talk just briefly, and Carol alluded to this, about the community outreach that we've done over the last couple months. Um, we did present the plans to the Kenwood Neighborhood Association in January, and they took a vote in their February board meeting and unanimously supported the project. We also talked with adjacent neighbors to the north, so two houses closest to the Polad residents, and they also, I think, uh, wrote letters in support of the project. About a week and a half ago, when the city sent out the HPC notice of public hearing, a lot of uh, several neighbors were alarmed when they read that we were proposing demolishing more than 60% of the residents. So many of them contacted Linda Mack, who you know, uh, was on the HPC for 12 years and also an architectural historian, and she's also a neighbor. So she and I um, got the neighbors together last week to present the plans. And I think there were about eight to 10 people on that call, and everybody was very supportive of the project. So I just illustrate that to point out that the community outreach Part of this process has been very important to us. We want to make sure that the surrounding neighborhood and the association were um, completely comfortable with, with our proposed changes. Can I go to slide two? As John uh, pointed out, um, this is a significant house and significant property. Um, it's a unique property from the perspective that it's on a point. Um, I can only think of one other house on Lake of the Isles that um, is located on a point um, and with views both from the east and to the south towards the lake. Can I have slide three, please? As John laid out, the house was constructed in 1929 and there were three um, expansion projects uh, since 1929, the first one being 1936 in addition to the attic, in 1984, in addition to the garage, and in 1999, the existing, the original kitchen was demolished and a new kitchen and addition was created in 99. Can I have slide four, please? So one of the first things I wanna point out to everybody is that this is a photo of the front of the house as it currently exists. And essentially, this, the front of the house will stay exactly like this. We are not touching both the original house and the original sunroom that's located on the left side of this uh, photo. The only thing we are proposing doing is where that gumdrop shaped hedge is located, putting another window that replicates the detailing and proportion of the surrounding uh, windows to add a little bit more light uh, to the living room. 
but otherwise it's staying exactly as you see it. Can we go to slide five, please? As John illustrated, what we are suggesting though, um, set back about 21 feet from the main uh, front facade of the original house, um, is a north uh, garage that we are rebuilding. And we are rebuilding that for several reasons. One of them, as John mentioned, the porte cochere. The opening by today's standards is very narrow, especially when you have to navigate around the bay window. So the car actually has to navigate a, a turn around that and then kind of straighten the car in order to go through that. And if you look at the, the, bay wind, <laughs> the bay window and the port cochere, you can see extensive damage on the bay window corner and also scraping along the port cochere. So by today's standards, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult uh, element to navigate um, every day to go into the house. The other thing that um, to point out is that the garage level is four feet lower than the main level of the house. And so to get into the house from the garage, you have to go up a stairway in the garage, go over the porte cochere and go down another flight of stairs into the kitchen. Can I see slide six, please? So this is a view of the back of the house. You can see the port cochere and behind the car, you can see the line between the concrete foundation wall and the brick. That's basically the level of the main floor. So you can see that the garage is located four feet below that. And again, as I pointed out, you have to navigate two sets of stairs um, to get into the house. And there is an elevator, an existing elevator located in the uh, main part of the house, but there's not an elevator located at the garage. Can I see slide seven, please? So this is an existing site plan, kind of illustrating some of the issues. One, you can see the car along the driveway. You can see the bay window that it kind of has to navigate around. Number three is the narrow court cochere. Number two are the two stairways that people have to go up and down to get into the house. And then one thing I wanna point out that when the garage was added in 1984, the Northwest corner of the garage was actually placed on the property line, inches from the property line. And by today's standards, you need a minimum of eight feet. So the garage is very close to the neighboring structure. Slide eight, please. So this is the proposed new site plan and the, the pale pink that you see, that's the existing house that is to remain. Uh, so you can see the whole front is remaining, the south uh, sunroom, which is original is remaining. And the two additions are set back from that original um, east and south face. The one addition, the proposed garage is also um, located eight feet from the property line. So it's respecting current setback rules. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's set back about 23 feet from the main facade of the house. And then the south addition is proposed to be a kitchen and family room on the main floor and then the upper level owner suite. Um, and again, that is, um, we are proposing setting that back from the sunroom, the original sunroom 17 feet. And that's an important piece to remember is that when people are walking along the sidewalk or driving or at the lake, when they look at this house, the original 1929 historic uh, front entry and south is the, the element of the structure that's closest to the sidewalk and the street. The additions are set back. So the most prominent reading of this Tudor Revival home will always be that 1929 um, original house. You can see we have relocated the uh, driveway to the west edge of the property and we got park board approval, Minneapolis park board approval to do that last summer. We actually had to do a traffic study to make sure that pulling out of that driveway was a safe condition because of the curve um, and it was and they unanimously agreed that we uh, could shift that driveway. 
And then in terms of landscaping, the idea is to very much keep within a lot of the historic kind of language of landscape on the Lake of the Isles, which is a lot of manicured hedges, ornamental trees, and canopy trees. Slide nine. So these are a couple renderings just to give you an idea of what this will look like. So at the front, which is the east side of the house, you can see to the right is the rebuilt garage addition, and then to the left is the original house. Can I have slide 10? So this is at grade uh, of that front. So again, um, the original house stays intact. You can see that third window um, on the left located in the living room to get more light into there. And then on the right, you can see the rebuilt um, garage. You can see, as John mentioned, we're kind of um, replicating the proportion of the port cochere with the same kind of detailing. But instead of driving through it, it will be a large window with divided lights. And then above that arched opening is um, the Oriole window that will be rebuilt um, from the original um, garage. Can I have slide 11, please? And it was a very conscious choice on our part that, you know, that the Tudor revival style of the original house, that we were going to basically continue that language so that the additions um, were quieter, again, in keeping with the spirit of the, the house, that they didn't stand out and in any way dominate the original house. So on the right hand side, you can see the original um, sunroom with the original gable of the, the house. And then the cross gable um, is the south addition kitchen and owner suite. And then it steps down much like the original sunroom into the family room. We're reconstructing the chimneys. And then in the back, you can see the north um, addition um, with <clears throat> uh, three dormers and under the garage doors. Can I have slide 12? So one of the things that we're proposing doing is um, with the landscape is right now, if you drive by the property, there are 12 foot high hedges that really conceal the entire backyard and south side of the house. And the owner wants this, the landscaping to be much more open to the larger lake community. And so you can see it will be a series of lower hedges, stone walls, flowering plants, um, window boxes, so that, again, it doesn't look like a walled off structure, which it does now, but very much opens out to the community. Can I have slide 13, please? And the last image is you can see from the north, the rebuilt garage, eight feet from the, the property line. So again, there's there's more airspace between this rebuilt garage and the neighboring property. Thank you. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your comments. Are there any questions for the applicant team? Commissioner Howard. Good evening. Thank you for that presentation. It was really, really helpful to, to see it from your perspective. I am, um, I, I truly appreciate the challenges of that driveway and um, I, I, I get the need to move that to the other side and I'm glad to see that the, that the park board has been supportive of that. Um, that definitely would, will make that property much easier to, to access. And I, and I truly appreciate also the desire to work with universal design standards. I think it's important that we look at accessibility in all design and in, that includes rehabilitations. Um, I'm curious, have you considered retaining all of the original house along with the original drive or the original garage and just filling in the port crochet um, and reusing the original garage as part of the new design instead of tearing it down and trying to reconstruct it in a way that isn't really truly a reconstruction. I'm just trying to get a sense of what other kind of alternative designs you've looked at and explored as part of looking at this rehab. Yeah, really, really good question, Commissioner. Thank you for that. Um, we did look at that. That was the first thing that we looked at. 
But because, and I think John pointed this out, that whole north wing, which is the garage, is four feet lower than the main level of the house. So if you left the porte cochere and left that, you know, the, the original one car garage, it would be four feet lower than the house. Then the, if you elevate the garage, uh, the new garage, you've got this weird remnant that's four feet lower than the main level and the new garage elevation. Do you know what I'm, I'm saying? So you're, so you're saying that the, um, the original garage level would be four foot lower than the yeah than the garage yeah. as opposed to that 1984 addition that's to the rear right so that's the problem it's like a knuckle in there that would be um depressed mm -hmm. and you'd somehow have to navigate that uh or you'd have to bypass that with the new garage that's up at that four feet and we just couldn't figure out how to do that so in some ways you're just kind of embalming that one car garage that's depressed and it, just, it didn't seem it it seemed really weird I, I think I understand what you're saying thank you yeah because again that that whole north is four feet lower than the main level thank you Which, are there you know, any oh, oh I was gonna say are there any other questions for the applicant John alluded to it, actually, sorry, if I can just uh, yeah. uh, mention one more thing. John alluded to it. So if you recall the original, uh, that North garage, there is um, there is a bedroom and a bathroom over the port cocher. So that's the other issue. That is also four feet lower than the second floor. So there's all these different levels in the house. So if you were retaining that original one car garage, that whole thing is misaligned with the main level of the house in addition to a new garage that would be up at the same level. So it's it's just, there's a lot of stairs, not only on the outside of the building, but also internal. Even in the master bathroom, which is nowhere near this north wing, there are stairs going up into that bathroom. So it's a, it, it, it has no, it, it's a very difficult house to navigate if anybody has any mobility issues. Thank you for that explanation. Um, are there any other questions for the applicant team? don't see any at this time. Thank you for your comments. Um, with that, I will move on to the public comments. Um, I'm going to take the list of pre-registered speakers in order and then open the floor to any other speakers who may be in the queue. Again, if you could please provide your name and address before making your comments um, and press star six, wait to hear the pre-recorded message to activate your microphone so that we can hear you. And the next person in the queue is Linda Mack. Hello. <laughs> and Hi. I asked the question that everybody always asks, can you hear me? <laughs> because we have no idea. <laughs> um, I gather you can. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, Commissioners. Linda Mack here. I uh, am uh, living at 2539 Thomas Avenue South in Minneapolis, which is three blocks from the uh, the subject property. And I think that you should have received my letter of February 18th. And so I will not um, re repeat what I wrote in the letter. Uh, I just wanted to bring a little bit of perspective to this <laughs> this project, which is um, really going to be a great addition to the neighborhood. Um, I know it's hard to think of these as burdened properties when, when they're um, so expensive, but really this property has been burdened with some 
accessibility issues that um, have made it unoccupied really a good part of the time, just as I notice in the neighborhood goes on the market, doesn't sell. And um, it just needs to be given some loving care, which I believe this design team is doing. Uh, of course, before you, it's technically a 60% demolition. And I was very interested to hear and uh, learn kind of how that was, um, that number was come to. But uh, practically speaking, it's more like a 60% renovation. I mean, by and large, the um, it's the additions, the kind of some unfortunate additions to the original house that are being removed. And one thing I would take issue with in, in Dr. Smoley's, uh, as usual, excellent staff report is uh, when he said that only the original facade of the 1920 house remains. Really, the 1920 house remains intact. Uh, these later additions and the, the port crochet addition or the port crochet that was part of the original house are removed. And then there are some additions which are indeed substantial. So again, it, you know, technically it's a 60% demolition. Practically speaking, it's at least a 60% renovation that will really bring uh, new life to the property and ensure its long-term viability. So thank you very much. And thanks for continuing your service under what are difficult circumstances. <laughs> thanks. Thank you for your comments, Linda. And yes, we did receive your letter. Um, I don't have any other pre-registered speakers, so I would like to check to see if there is anyone else in the queue who would like to speak for or against this application. If so, please press star six on your phone and let me know that you are there. I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, I'd like to again check to see if commissioners have any questions before I close the public hearing. Okay, I don't see any questions. So I will close the public hearing. Um, commissioners, let's discuss, are there concerns or comments on this proposed application? Um, I think this is a bit of a tricky one um, in that I can understand the frustrations um, of the homeowner with the many varied levels um, inside the house. I understand that that's difficult. Um, on the other hand, I also understand staff's concerns and um, questions about the economic viability of the property. I'm curious what other people are thinking. I think, you know, looking at, as we know, the next step would be um, more significant um, research into the property um, and a designation study, which is always interesting. Um, on the other hand, we know that that adds a lot of time uh, for applicants. So I, I'm curious what people are thinking. I guess I'm now realizing maybe I do have a question for staff. Sorry, John. Um, this designation study, would it be specifically for this property as a landmark or would it be for the potential historic district? Madam Chair, members of the commission, the designation study would be for this property as a landmark. Okay, thank you. Just want to make sure we keep that in mind. Commissioner Sandbolt. I'll say what I'm 
kind of struggling with here is this isn't an opportunity for us to provide kind of comments and um, and feedback on the proposed design. Our option here is either to cause designation study or to approve as is. Um, so I think in a lot of cases we're used to being able to provide some feedback on the design and maybe condition the design, whereas here it's kind of all in or 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 um, either approving the design as is or approving the designation study. I understand that the that the building we're talking about is potentially eligible, but I'm kind of struggling with designating it. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons that I would argue that um, we designation might not be appropriate. And so personally, I'm I'm leaning towards um, that you know that we would not move forward with the designation study. But interested to hear what other people's thoughts are. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. I recognize that same question of designating this as an individual landmark. I think what I'm kind of keeping in the back of my mind is if we allowed this to move forward, would it remove it from being eligible if the district went forward in the future? Are we removing too much of the integrity? Commissioner Howard. Um, I, I, I appreciate uh, the the thoughts that both you and Commissioner Sandbolt are having related to the property as a whole. I think we need to look at our ordinance and what we're supposed to be doing at this. And and Commissioner Sandbolt is correct. It's it's we, we kind of have two choices. We can't really talk about the design as proposed, um, except the fact where it speaks to the economic value or usefulness of the existing structure, including its current use, cost of renovation and feasible alternative uses. And that's why I asked about the, the alternatives that they looked at. Um, I personally think that there are feasible alternatives to demolishing that garage. And um, I agree with staff that the property is significant so the amount of information that we have in the in the documentation we've been given and that it has integrity. We know that there is no unsafe or dangerous condition on the property, so um, that doesn't come to play at all. But when we, we look at our destructive destruction of historic resource portion of our ordinance, it's, um, you know, we can make a finding that there are no reasonable alternatives to the destruction. I personally think that there are and that they haven't been explored. Um, and so I, I'm gonna have to uh, count on my understanding of the ordinance when I vote on this. And I think it's a significant property. And I think that there are, are reasonable alternatives. I think that, you know, as I said, I understand wanting to move the, the driveway. And I think, you know, removing um, the later additions makes sense, um, but that's not what we're, you know, really looking at today. So um, those are my thoughts. I'm I'm leaning toward uh, uh, agreeing with staff on this one. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, yeah, I think this this is difficult because of specific ordinance language and what we are specifically looking at today versus the wider project. Commissioner Booty. Thank you, Chair Sundberg. Um, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Howard's framing of this because I think it was really helpful for me to kind of think about like we're looking at it as if there's no reasonable economic alternatives to this. And I I might slightly disagree. I think there there is certain I, I the the fact that there's demolition and replacement of windows is a little bit um, making me lean towards supporting staff findings for this. Um, but I also am finding myself agreeing more with the applicant in terms of like the fact that this is a significant investment for the house that would make it very attractive and viable for preserving it. And I feel like there are they're taking a really great step in terms of um, being very mindful of the design um, of the original house and in terms of additions um, adding to that and not taking away from that original uh, front facing viewpoint. I'm still undecided, so I'm interested to see what others are are thinking about that. Um, and I do kind of I, I do appreciate the the framing of you know what we're looking at today of 
our ordinance. And I think that's going to be really where my decision is going to land is how well or not I think those alternatives could be explored versus um, not. So uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Commissioner Booty. Um, yes, I think so that it's kind of an added level of difficulty of trying to um, envision what else could be done on the site. Um, Andrea, do you have something that will help us in this? Yeah, I'm actually a Andrea Burke supervisor for um, historic preservation section in CPEN. I wanted to kind of help further frame some of the comments that I'm hearing to help you in making your decision. Um, kind of further expanding off of Commissioner Howard's comments in that unfortunately because of the way our ordinance is written because of the zoning code is written yes we are evaluating this as a demolition it is an all or nothing it is either you are going to approve the demolition and therefore it is out of your hands you don't have any say on it from this point forward or you um you know deny the demolition and kick off a study um Unfortunately, the design doesn't really have a play into this, so it's kind of you almost have to kind of put on blinders and really just follow the the ordinance language as whether or not they've met their burden of proof for those findings. And one, you know, is there an unsafe condition? Um, kind of similar thing as we went to uh, through for earlier projects um, last month. Uh, or a couple months ago, and then, you know, two, does it have significance integrity if it does then considering the reasonable alternatives to demolition, have they met that? Are there reasonable alternatives or not? And I know I'm reiterating, but I'm trying to further frame it up because this one is funny in that you can look at it and say, well, maybe that design, if we did this, but maybe that garage could do this. And well, but if they're only doing this, but unfortunately we, the ordinance in this application isn't put before you that way. Um, legally, you have to follow the findings of the ordinance to make a decision on this, whether or not you are in favor or not of the design. It's sort of a, it's an all or nothing deal. Either yes, you're going to move it toward designation or no, you're going to approve a demolition. Um, and I know it's hard to see it that way, given the the nuances of this particular project, but in, in helping you decide which way to go, maybe that can provide a, a different way to to imagine it. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I think that's important both for commissioners to hear and for the applicant to understand that just de depending on which way this vote goes, um, it is not based off of our feelings about the design and how well it works with the existing building, um, but that we're only allowed to keep in mind, do we think some other alternative could be done <laughs> other than this demolition? Um, I think this is especially hard since it's not a complete demolition, just a 60, you know, like the entire building's not going, then it's much easier for commissioners to, to understand. Um, but understanding that it wouldn't have been perceived as demolition if it had been less than 60%, um, you know, this it just makes it a little tricky. Um, I'm also, like Commissioner Howard, leaning towards agreeing with staff findings here. Uh, there are alternatives that could be done um, that would address the accessibility issues in other ways. Um, Commissioner Howard. Yeah, and thank you, thank you, Andrea, for for stepping in on on the conversation and, and framing it again based on our ordinance. And that's, I, I asked about the garage because if the original garage were retained, I suspect that we would be under 60% demolition. <laughs> and so that's where I started thinking about what is the alternative, not necessarily the design, but if there's a way to keep that original mass of the garage, there might be a way to get it under the, the 60%. Um, which is the definition of, of demolition. So um, I have to go with my gut when it comes to following what our ordinance says. So I'm going to make a motion and, and I would um, appreciate, you know, if, if additional commissioners have things to say, let's just get a motion on the table. We can always continue the conversation. Um, so I'd make a motion to um, uh, 
deny the demolition of the historic resource application, establish interim protection, and direct the planning director to prepare or cause to be prepared a designation study of the property. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Is there a second? Vanderijk seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Vanderijk. Is there any further discussion? I'm not seeing any discussion. Um, again, I'd really like the applicant and the architect to understand that this is not a reflection of the design, um, but simply the verbiage of our ordinance and how we have to interpret that. Um, and with that, would the clerk please call the roll on the motion? Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Nay. Commissioner Struthers. Commissioner Vanderike. Aye. Sunberg. Aye. Yes, and one nay. Thank you. That motion passes. Um, the applicant may talk to staff tomorrow about next steps. Um, that concludes our public hearing items for tonight. So um, I'm wondering if commissioners or staff have any announcements or new commission business to discuss. Um, I guess I will mention that this is my final meeting and um, so I will be leaving at this point um, and I'm excited to hear if our new commissioner was approved. I think that her approval was earlier today, hopefully, <laughs> um, but I'm sure we'll hear from Andrea on that. Um, and it sounds like Commissioner Booty has an announcement. Hello, yes, uh, thank you, Chair Sundberg. Uh, Andrea sent out an email to us a couple weeks ago about Rethos's Buildings on Main Street Conference, which is coming up uh, April 21st through 22nd in Faribault. Um, it does have a, uh, one of the intended audiences is Heritage Preservation Commissioners. Uh, it will be, um, you know, centered around Rethos's Main Street work, which is in smaller towns, but any, any main, uh, Heritage Preservation Commissioners are welcome to attend. Um, could talk a lot about some of the financial difficulties in rehabbing downtown commercial buildings, um, as well as um, uh, talking through historic preservation ordinances and reviews like that. Um, it will be in person um, and you can find more information on the link that Andrea sent, but thought I would, as a Rethos representative on the HBC, uh, make that announcement today. Thank you, Commissioner Booty. Um, I feel like I had an announcement and then I just completely forgot it. Um, gosh, what was I going to say? I don't remember at all. Um, Andrea, I will turn things over to you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, our uh, proposed candidate to the HPC was uh, voted uh, at the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee today. Uh, for recommended for approval. So that will then go to the next step to the city council and signature by mayor. So hoping to have uh, that commissioner seated by the next meeting on March 15th. Um, so that is the update on that. I don't have any other further update than our uh, resolution that we read for a departing commissioner and chair at that. Um, with you departing and I before um, I have Rachel read our resolution I just wanted to say thank you so much for rolling with all of the changes over the last two years with um, with going virtual and taking over chair from a previous uh, chair who I think her last meeting was in person and putting together um, scripts and putting together uh, you know making sure these virtual meetings got off to such a smooth start, which I know has been greatly appreciated by me. And I think all the other commissioners, I can speak for them as well. 
you have participated in many uh, big projects in your time on this commission, uh, which of course predates me. Um, but thank you again. This has been no easy feat the last two years to to roll with all the changes, and um, I am greatly appreciative. Um, I guess with that, I, we can either read the resolution and others I think would like to speak, or we can let others speak and then read the resolution. Um, I'm going to make the executive decision and say, let's do the resolution first, and then we will have encores afterwards. So Rachel, thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Uh, resolution of appreciation for Madeline Sundberg for her dedicated service to the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. Whereas the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission is the quasi judicial citizen review panel that provides direction and regulation on preservation business within the city of Minneapolis. And whereas Madeline has served on the city of Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission since January of 2017 and has participated in over 105 public hearings and in countless deliberations and actions of the commission. And whereas Madeline has helped to shape the preservation of Minneapolis through decisions on properties designated as landmarks, historic districts, and nominations to the National Register of Historic Places, including the Tilson Built Homes Historic District, Northrop Mall Historic District, the Church of Incarnation Historic District, the Lyndhurst Residential Historic District, Joyce Memorial Methodist Church, Sound 80 Studios, the Minneapolis Armory, and Zinsmaster Baking Company building. And whereas Madeline has demonstrated tremendous dedication and generosity in sharing both her time and knowledge. And whereas the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission wishes to formally recognize Madeline's dedicated service to the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission and city. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission and the staff to the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission of the City of Minneapolis, that we thank Madeline Sundberg for her faithful and constructive service and extending the progress of the city and in promoting the welfare of its people. That we extend her our best wishes for good health and happiness in all of life's endeavors, trusting that the friendships and understanding built in our mutual undertakings will be with us always. Approved. Uh, Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission on this first day of March 2022. Thank you. I I appreciate that. Um, it looked like Commissioner Smalley also wished to speak. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to take a moment to to thank you on behalf of your current staff and former staff as well. You've been here for quite a while, and I know I tend to think of you as masterfully handling all of our online pandemic meetings, which are really challenging, but you were so integral in person to many of our earlier highly successful efforts, which some of which were mentioned in the study, but I'm thinking you know, in particular of our um, efforts to identify and protect properties associated with underdocumented groups to include the Church of the Incarnation in your uh, old neighborhood there. Um, you were just so terrific, you know, uh, joining us, joining staff in trying to reach out to property owners and identify, uh, you know, whether they'd be willing to support these uh, grant funded designation efforts, trying to keep our preservation program really positive and proactive. And in the case of Church of the Incarnation, of course, that was a very successful um, historic district designation. Now, as you saw a few months ago, National Register listing, which you all reviewed and supported. And I received a very nice note from Father Kevin McDonough, a uh, pastor over at the church, who noted that in January, uh, 821 families received over 31,000, the equivalent of 26,000 meals at their food center that they opened up on Thanksgiving. And so it's really nice to see the uh, the impact that your um, service has had in a variety of ways, and I thank you for that. No, oh, thank you, John. It's been a uh, really enjoyable time on the commission. Um, I hope that I'm the only chair who only ever does virtual meetings um, after doing two years of only virtual meetings. Since I think my first meeting as chair was our first meeting when the pandemic hit. Um, 
which has you know, been an interesting experience for all of us. Um, and I'm hoping this is not a permanent goodbye to the commission. I'm hoping that I circle back here uh, maybe in several years. We'll see where life's at at that point. Um, I would like to uh, give my best to the next chair and thank Barbara for stepping in until elections can be held. And I'd also really like to encourage our newer commissioners to consider running for some of those positions um, at the elections because I think it is a good way to get further involved and maybe a slightly different understanding of how the commission works. Um, are there any other announcements, although I think I'm now technically not chair, so I don't know, Barbara, if you would like to close out the meeting. Oh, you're I think you're still chair unless you're no longer on the commission, so. Okay, I didn't know when, <laughs> if it ended with the resolution. I I would think that you would be able to close out today. Okay, meeting. I can close out the meeting. It does Is not. There, hmm? You are still chair, it does I'm not still chair. the resolution. Okay, it doesn't know what the result. No, don't want to mess things up here. Um, are there any other announcements or new business? Okay, I don't see any. Um, with that, we have completed all items on the agenda for this meeting. I will again ask members and staff if there are any other matters to come before this meeting. There being no other business this meeting, if not and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the HPC is March 15th, 2022. Thank you, everyone.